those two camps and numerous books and articles have been written on this controversy. The 19th century is generally portrayed as the crucial period of the bifurcation of the common linguistic house of Kariboli with British rule functioning as the catalyst of this dividing process. The central piece of evidence put forward to corroborate the supposition is Lalo Jilal's Brehm Sagar, as the language of this book is often referred to as the starting point of linguistic cleansing in Hindi prose. The core of this paper is the question if the language of the Brehm Sagar can be really called an artificial Sanskritized construct carved out of Urdu to provide Hindus with a new prose variety of Kariboli. What is meant by the way, what is meant by the way by the term Sanskritized Hindi, we read all the time, we write all the time and so on. After all, for a new Indo-Aryan language such as Hindi, having Sanskrit words in its vocabulary shouldn't come as a surprise. In my definition, the term Sanskritized refers to the outcome of a deliberate procedure to substitute Tathpak words as well as words of foreign origin with corresponding Tatsam words and Sanskrit neologisms, which are called Sanskritisms, by default. For example, the Tathpak word dud, milk, with the Tatsam word dukt, and widespread foreign loan words such as Persian chashma, glasses, and Japanese rickshaw with uncommon Sanskritisms like upanetra, a second pair of eyes, and narayan, man vehicle. This style can definitely be called artificial, but it played virtually no role in the development of modern Hindi prose. The style that the vast majority of Hindi authors, including Lalu Jilal, preferred was not Sanskritized, but Sanskrit oriented, that is a language that generally, generously borrows words from its natural source Sanskrit, but is also open with varying degrees to words of foreign origin. Because of lack of time, I have to leave out the chapter Hindi and Urdu prose literature before 1800. In this chapter, you can read for yourself that Hindi and Urdu prose followed two very distinct styles, which points to the absence of a common written prose tradition with a balanced vocabulary from which Hindi and Urdu could have split into two styles. Again, I don't refer to the colloquial speech, which was always mixed. I'm talking about uh, uh, literary prose traditions where you copy manuscripts and so on. Uh, so therefore we have the manuscripts. Okay, the Brehm Sagar published in 1810 is the first book printed in Kariboli Hindi. It was composed by Fort Williams Parker Munchi Lalo Jilal by the order of John Gilchrist, the first professor of Hindustani at Fort William College, a language school established in Kolkata in 1800. In the introduction, the author states that he wrote his work, Yamani Bhasha Chod Dili Agri Ki Khari Boli Mein. Lalo Jilal simply states here that he used the Khari Boli of Delhi and Agra, leaving aside its Urdu variety. This statement eventually led to a colossal misunderstanding with far-fetched suppositions that have been uncritically passed on from one generation of scholars to others. I believe that the one crucial source of contestation that led to the assumption of a purist agenda of Lalo Jilal is his use of the term Yamani for Urdu. I will argue in my paper in more detail that Yamani used to be in Hindi a neutral term for Persian or in our case, Urdu. Thus, to connect the sole mention of the glossonym Yamani to a Hindi Hindu nationalist agenda would not be appropriate. Now, George Grierson was perhaps the first Orientalist to postulate the creation of Kariboli Hindi through the Prem Sagar in 1889. I quote, in 1803, under Gilchrist's tuition, Lalo Chilal wrote the Prem Sagar in the mixed Urdu language with this peculiarity that he used only nouns and particles of Indian instead of those of Arabic or Persian origin. The result was practically a newly invented speech. For though the grammar was the same as that of the prototype, the vocabulary was almost entirely changed." End of quotation. 
Now, I could quote at least a dozen more statements that reiterates Grierson's postulate in a copy and paste fashion. A more recent one is very drastic. I quote, Brehm Sagar is at the heart of the disciplining of other linguistic cartography in the 18th century in which Indo-Persian underwent a secular linguistic purge. Secular purges of language are thus part and parcel of the invention narrative around Brehm Sagar and explain the constitutive violence at the birth of the linguistic modern subject, end of quotation. To put the matter straight right away, the language of the Brehm Sagar is not a modern invention of an artificial Hindi, but rather a continuation of a deep-rooted literary tradition in Northwest India, oral and textual, that was due to the confluence of different Cogne dialects, Kariboli, Brajbhasha, morphologically hybrid, but lexically predominantly characterized by Tatsam, Tadbhav, and Deshi words, especially when adopting religious works that were originally written in Sanskrit. In the previous chapter, literary testimonies of 18th century Kariboli Hindi marked by an admixture of other dialects and a heavily Sanskrit-oriented vocabulary were presented to corroborate this fact. The Brahm Sagar is based on a Braj adaption of the 10th canto of the Bhagavata Purana written by Chatur Mishra in 1567. So it is only natural that Laluji Lal retained a lot of Sanskrit words of the original work in his Kariboli adaption. What is the need to replace Sanskrit words of the original texts of the 16th century if these words are still commonly used and understood by Hindi speakers in the 19th century? For example, the word Nadi, it's Sanskrit. Why do you have to uh, substitute that? Um, the conclusion of the Indologist Jules Bloch in 1914 that I quote, prose parts of the Prem Sagar were in Urdu with Persian words replaced everywhere by Indo-Aryan words, end of quotation, is simply absurd. But that you can read in uh, Wikipedia. Uh, the following passage will give an idea of the Hindi Laloji Lal uses in the Prem Sagar. Now get a feel for the language. Shri Shukadev ji bole ki Maharaj, ek din Nanda ji ne sanyam kar ikadashi vrat kiya. Din to snan, dhyan, bhajan, jab buja mein kata aur ratri jagran mein pitai. Jab che ghadi rehen rahi aur dvadashi bhai tab utke deh shut kar bhor hua jaan, dhoti angocha jhari le, jamna nahan chale, Tinke piche ke e gwalvi holie. Apart from its colloquial style, the comprehensibility of the Prim Sagar is such that a reader familiar with basic Hindi literature does hardly have to look up a Sanskrit word in the dictionary. In many instances, the Prim Sagar preserves with its lexicon a style in Hindi that often favors tatpaf words over tatsam words, Sanskrit words, making the language thereby more vernacular as has always been a common practice in Hakka literature. In regard to the choice of words, the Brim Sagar quite resembles the language of, the, of Rani Ketki Ki Kahani written by Insha Allah Khan at almost the same time. Laluji Lal composed this work. Insha Allah Khan in the introductory statement of his work declares to deliberately leave out all words of foreign origin. Bahar ki boli kuch uske beech mein na ho. Though Incha's story is devoid of Persian Arabic words, no one would accuse Incha Lakhan of inventing a new language for the Hindus by cleansing the common speech of Delhi of its foreign elements, as has been the case with Laloji Lal. Now, the reason why the Prem Sagar was not held in high esteem by most Indian literary historians is because the Hindi of Prem Sagar bears some morphological influences of Braj Bhasha. But this only shows how conventional the language of the Prem Sagar was, as all, uh, all Kari Boli Hindi writings had such admixtures. In today's times, when there is a strong demand to give local dialects more space in Hindi writings by adapting the standard language to the regional idioms, as we can see in the Hindi Anchalik, uh, regional literature, Laloji Lal's style would have been more than welcome 
as it offers a viable template for rendering um, uh, regional speech. But in the course of standardizing the Hindi language in the beginning of the 20th century, any deviation from the norm was considered detrimental, qualified as a shuti, impurity. So Laloji Lal was criticized for his Braj Ranjit style, I personally find very refreshing. Bhasha mein khas mithas hai, Braj ki mithi ki mahek hai. Bhatnagar's assertion that the Prem Sagar initiated, initiated a quote, secular linguistic purge, unquote, results from a conceptual misunderstanding. Owing to the Puranic genre, the vocabulary of Prem Sagar contains naturally many Sanskrit words. It was and is general practice in Hindi adaptions of Puranic literature to abundantly use words of Sanskrit origin to relate to modern times. No one would blame the Hindi and Urdu author Rahi Mazum Raza, who wrote the Sanskrit oriented Hindi script for the popular TV serial Mahabharat for deliberately cleansing the Hindi language of words from foreign origin to pursue a purist agenda. Or uh, just uh, or read the, the, the Urdu novel Basti uh, from Intazar Hussein when he uh, writes on um, uh, why there's this uh, Bhuchal earth camp. He writes uh, uh, um, because of Shesh Nag and you know the, the, the story. He wrote in uh, Sanskrit oriented Hindi, Adhik, Sahaita, Bhuchal, and so on. Um, as already mentioned, Nearly all the Sanskrit words Laloji Lal uses in the Brim Sagar are commonly understood by readers familiar with basic literary Hindi, which is one of the main reasons this work has enjoyed great popularity in the last two centuries, especially among an Indian readership. But what is more surprising, Laloji Lal uses several Persian Arabic words. Back in 1876, Samuel Kellogg pointed out in his grammar of the Hindi language that the Brahm Sagar and Ram Charit Manas have Arabic and Persian admixture. But though he gave a list of Persian Arabic words in the Manas, he unfortunately did not do so for the Brahm Sagar. So I have listed the Urdu words in my paper I found in the book. For example, he uses the Arabic word Vida, farewell, innumerable times. If he had replaced Vida with an uncommon Sanskritism, it would have certainly been justified to accuse uh, Laloji of artificially inventing a pure style. One also has to keep in mind that Laloji Lal also tr translated, in cooperation with other munchis, Braj works into Hindustani, that is Urdu, such as the Petal Pachisi. Owing to the secular genre of those works and the target language Urdu, those adaptions naturally contain much less words of Sanskrit origin. Thus, Laloji Lal wrote Kariboli in two different styles, Hindi and Urdu as was the common practice in the previous 18th century and exactly what Brahm Chand, the pioneer of modern Hindi and Urdu prose literature would do in the following 20th century, keeping these two literary styles apart by using a considerably different lexical register in the respective Hindi and Urdu writings. For example, he wrote Kaffan first in Urdu in Jamia, in the campus of Jamia, uh, and the, uh, the, the word, um, um, what is the, uh, what, uh, um, uh, Darvaza in the Urdu version, in his Hindi version is Dwar. Now, okay, uh, the reason for that is another uh, seminar. It is only legit legitimate then to exonerate the Prem Sagar of the allegation of having invented an artificial Sanskritized Hindi. Now we come to ideology, the underlying agenda against the Prem Sagar. With the publication of Ram Chandra Shukla's Hindi Saitya Katihas, History of Hindi Literature, 1929, it should have become clear to everyone that Sanskrit-oriented Kariboli Hindi was not an invention of a language tutor in Fort William College who deliberately wanted to divide a unified language. As we know, Sanskrit-oriented Kariboli was in use in Northwest India at least a half a century before Fort William College was founded. We have the manuscripts in Patiala, Jaipur, and so on. Now, Orientalists such as Grierson and Block can be given the benefit of the doubt as they didn't have, the, have access to those Hindi works preceding 1800. But then their narrative of the invention of an artificial style in a colonial institution came in handy with the propagation of Hindustani 
from 1925 onwards. It influenced the academic discourse on the origins of Hindi and Urdu from the perspective of a pro-Hindustani ideology. Now, the ideology of mixing. Although the Sanskrit-oriented variety of Kariboli had deep roots, it posed an obstacle to the master plan of merging Hindi and Urdu into a common idiom. It was practical then to refer to Grierson and Bloch and project this traditional style as a recent artificial invention. Just get rid of the burden of so-called highbrow Sanskrit and Persian Arabic words in Hindi and Urdu respectively, and a true vernacular will emerge, so the myth. This is the style that Gilchrist, the first professor of Fort William College of Hindustani, had envisioned, in fact, for Hindi and Urdu, calling it uh, conciliating Hindustani. His rendering of Hindustani tales in 1798 was written for that purpose. Now, if you read the passage of one tale in my paper, you can see that Gilchrist promoted a balanced mixture of Hindi Udu words for his Hindustani. There should be, though, no misgivings whatsoever that the attempt to unify both styles of Kariboli under the umbrella of Hindustani was part of Fort William College's linguistic agenda to cater to colonial interests. For the East India Company, it would have been far more convenient and effective to rule the people of the Northwestern provinces, which is nowadays UP, uh, UP by using one language instead of taking recourse to do different styles that required much more effort to master. With regard to language, the principle of united emperor, unite and rule, was obviously the guiding principle. When Gilchrist calls the abundant use of Persian Arabic in Urdu and of Sanskrit in Hindi as, quote, pedantry, unquote, then we have to qualify this disparaging view as part of a colonial mindset that completely ignores indigenous conceptions of aesthetics when it comes to the written form of the language. To adapt the style of writing to the colloquial language has never been the one and only criterion that counts in South Asian literature. Of equal importance is the order of the text that is created through consciously chosen words so different from everyday speech. For expressing more complex matters, Sanskrit and Persian provided the necessary terms. The British officials, however, were never interested in develop developing Hindi and Urdu into full-fledged languages of literature, administration, and modern sciences. All they wanted is to master a colloquial mixed variety of Kariboli, Hindustani, to command their sepoys and servants. In this sense, the refusals of the Munchis of Fort William College to provide the colonial masters with such a hybrid prose work can be interpreted as a subversive act of resistance against the British language policy in order to preserve the indigenous literary traditions. It would have been so much easier for the British officials to learn from a book written in colloquial Hindustani. Instead, they had to study the Sanskrit-oriented Prem Sagar and the Persian-oriented Bago Bahar to pass the vernacular examination. Paradoxically, or rather tragically, the native language tutors of Fort William College are generally regarded as collaborators in a colonial project to divide society by using two distinct style of prose. I conclude few sentences. The, the emblematic description of Kariboli based Hindi Urdu, the this emblematic description of Hindi Urdu as one language to scripts was never true. It has always been one language, two styles. I don't see why the coexistence of two different literary styles of one language should be seen as anomaly. It should rather be regarded as an enrichment that preserves the colorful diversity of Kariboli in two, in two forms, Hindi and Urdu. Just watch the period film Sikandar by Sorab uh, Modi uh, in, from 1941. Puru, played by Sorab Modi, speaks in a Sanskrit-oriented Hindi and Alexander the Great, Prithviraj Kapoor, speaks in, um, uh, um, in Urdu. So what Puru says, Desh, Vishwas, Alexander the Great says, Mulk, Yakin, and so on. The Prem Sagar provided the necessary literary template for Hindi in the early phase of colonial rule. It is due to Laloji Lal's efforts in preserving the Sanskrit-oriented style of Kariboli that the British authorities gave recognition to the fact that there was not one way but two ways of doing Hindustani. 
though Urdu was the sole court language in the Northwestern provinces till 1900. As the Prem Sagar was practically the only Hindi book in the vernacular curriculum throughout the 19th century and even in the beginning of the 20th century, thousands and thousands of colonial British officers were being made aware of the composite linguistic culture in North India while studying the Hindi language with the help of the Prem Sagar. Therefore, you have so many dictionaries of the Prem Sagar, Prem Sagar and Bhago Bahar in Roman script, uh, because there was a market, because they had to pass the vernacular test. It's time, and, and what Professor uh, um, Davies said, if a language is not printed, it does virtually not exist. Now just imagine if the Brahm Sagar was not there because we had no other Hindi prose work till the late 19th century. Uh, it's, and, and, and another thing is that Gilchrist, what, uh, he, left, uh, he left India in 1804. So actually, Laloji Lal, he, he was not forced to, he was appointed for Hindustani Udo, he was not forced to write the Brahm Sagar till the end, but he did and he got it published in 1810. So it's time we appreciate Laloji Lal's comp contribution. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, <clears throat> I can see from the questions you are being asked in the chat oh. box that you mm. have, uh, that you've ruffled a few feathers here. I think there's, there are very interesting polemical points in your presentation, and I will leave the questions to those who have, who are more schooled in the tradition of Hindi, Urdu, especially of the 19th and early 20th century, which I'm not. However, I think I will throw one or two points at you, and if you have time, maybe we can return to them. I think at the heart of, of, of some of the categories that you are troubling in this paper, is really actually what constitutes language. And I think that you're one of the final things you came on to say that these are two different styles rather than two different languages. And I think we maybe we might want to think of what has been our cognitive understanding of language and whether that has undergone a shift from the 19th to the 20th century. You make a compelling argument about rescuing Prem Sagar from, from, from the notoriety that may have acquired in, in introducing a certain kind of style or language and so on. But what I couldn't help noticing in the examples that you provide, which you thought were very accessible and easy and not Sanskritized Hindi, fair enough, but I couldn't help noticing they were all references to Hindu rituals of the very upper caste Brahmins. So in some sense, I'm not sure whether caste doesn't have a dimension in the production of language or the register of, of the examples that we are citing here. So maybe we can come to it or not. I think I will hand over and to read out to you the questions that are being asked because I think they are far better questions and compelling ones that you might want to respond to. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Kotari. Shall I read them together or perhaps I'll read two together and then you can respond. Okay. And then if we have more time, I'll, I'll, I'll read the others. Mm -hmm. Is that all right? Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. So uh, the first comment is uh, by Professor Hans Harder um, and uh, Professor Zaidi has also responded to it. So we'll sort of read it. I'll read both together. Uh, Professor Hans Harder writes, I think the most ironic thing about Prem Sagar is that it puts a tradition into print that a few decades later, Victorian critics would want to disown as frivolous, obscene, etc. To which um, uh, Dr. Sa Professor Saidi has also commented. To continue Hans's point, isn't it even more ironical that even though disowned by Victorian critics and later reformist critics right up to 20th century, this is this kind of prose narratives enjoyed huge popularity in Hindu or Urdu print, Chandra Kant and Dastani Amar Hamas, Hamza being cases in point. In addition to that, um, uh, Professor Hans Hader has also asked uh, a pertinent question here, and I'll just read that out as well. By saying that Khadiboli Hindi in script was common before, you are exculpating the colonists, uh, the colonialists, by insinuating that they wanted a mixed style, you make them responsible again. But by saying that Lala Jilal and company did not obey, you put them out to the game again. So where do we put them? I'll let you respond. 
Okay. Uh, 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 first, first of all, uh, uh, the, the first question. Yes, the uh, 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 Laloji Lal was uh, disowned by uh, 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 by the orthodox uh, 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 um, uh, literary historians Ramchandra Shukla because it was mixed with Brach and 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 uh, and it was disowned by um, you might be surprised with Paradendu Harishchandra because of uh, because um, um, Krishna's Leela with the gopis was uh, depicted. And this was against the uh, um, um, Victorian morals. So uh, therefore, um, um, Prem Sagar is, so to say, the villain. Yeah. So the first book of, of, of uh, 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 in, in modern Hindi uh, prose is, you know, disowned by everyone. So therefore, we don't, uh, and, and even by me, I, you know, for me, it was like, uh, or Brahm Sagar, artificial, and Fort William College, British, and uh, and then you know Paradendos. So I, I didn't read that book. So when I read that book, I was I was like, come, uh, come on, what? such a sweet language, and so on. And um, yeah. Then the second uh, question. Uh, sorry, maybe um, um, because I'm asked, um, um, was yeah. about um, Dev uh, Devkinandan. Katri's uh, language is it? Uh, would you like me to read the last question by Professor Hans Hader? Uh, I think it was that this, I've already answered that. I think the second yeah. language was about. Uh, um, no, that, yeah, it's about Chandrakanta. Yeah. Chandra now, Chandra, now that's very interesting. The Chandrakanta is very interesting. You, Chand you see, the uh, uh, <laughs> Hindustani was not a future project. We say that Hindustani is a future project that could not develop because of partition. Hindustani was the main literary language with the patronage of, um, uh, 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 of British government. Look at the language of the school books, therefore call it colonial, colonial um, Nagri Hindustani, which written in Nagri and Urdu script, everyone could understand. But this Hindustani, which everyone could understand, and was the uh, uh, dominated uh, 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 the literature was um, disowned by Premchand for many reasons. I will, uh, I will I won't go into that. Uh, and I have to say even by Mahatma Gandhi. Now the reason for that is because Mahatma Gandhi saw Hindustani as a syncretism. So in the, in his ver uh, vision of Hindustani, Sanskrit and Persian Arabic has to have, uh, have to be on par, 50, 50%. But anyway, this is another story. So that project of Hindustani and uh, 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 and Bremchand, he wrote, the, the when he grew up, he read all this Delisma and Dastans, but he distanced himself from this uh, 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 style of, of, of language. Everyone could understood. And the reason being because for him, Hindustani was not, um, the vehicle to transport um, uh, realism. He brought realism, and uh, in his in his speech, he said that we have enough of all this dance dance. Let's let's talk about the real problems. And um, uh, there are many issues on that. Why Premchand? Sorry uh, for that. I need a new uh, seminar um, um, on its own. And then there was something with a colonial. Um, the, what what did they do with the British? I I this. Um, can you say it in um, um, in simple vernacular language? Can you, language so can you read? Can you read Torson's question? Yes, shall I? I'll, I'll do that. Um, all right. So this is Dr. Torson's question. If my memory does not fail me completely, I read it long ago. Inshallah Khan in Rani Ketki ki kahani claims that common opinion considered it impossible to write a story using only tatpa words and none of outside origin, and that he wrote the story to prove them wrong. So he seems to indicate that what, that what he was doing was unusual. How does this fit with the Prem Sakar and other texts you are quoting, which seem to indicate that it was not at all an unusual practice to stick to, stick to these kind of words? Yes, I can explain this. Now, Rani Ketki Kikahani, when you read the, uh, the language, uh, um, Inshallah Khan wrote that because he was bored. He was simply bored. See, if you are bored, you know, let's write English without Latin words. He was bored because when you see what he wrote in, in Urdu, for example, he wrote uh, um, uh, experiments. 
uh, uh, like uh, um, uh, writing Udo without, without using Garf and Sheen. And he had all these experiments. It was not literary history. It was not to address a wider public. It was for his own um, um, uh, joy to say, I can do this, because he knew Persian. And he was a polyglot, and he was a, a genius uh, with languages. So, but when you read Rani Ketli Kahani, and, and there are Sanskrit words in it, the, the, uh, the problem I have when you read it, there's something, something is fishy, something, the words are very simple, but it is somehow, for me, it was always artificial. See, when I read uh, Prem Sagar, it's like, uh, when I read it, it's like, in a, I read it in a flow, it, very natural. And some things I cannot articulate, something is wrong with uh, Rani Keti Kikahani, I cannot, it's not the vocabulary, uh, but it's, it's, it's somehow, um, um, there, there, so it is uh, so actually, but what happens is that literary historians and uh, said, yes, uh, um, um, Rani, but Rani Kikahani is more has no Braj influence. Yeah, it might have Punjab influence with a plural, but it has no uh, Braj influence, and therefore Rani Kikahani was the, the role model, even for pra Paradendu. And uh, interestingly, uh, um, when we talk about Shud Hindi, what do you understand by Shud Hindi? Interestingly, Bharat, uh, uh, the Nagri Pracharani Sabha, the definition of Shud Hindi, of the Nagri Pracharani Sabha, and of Paradendu was when you spoke of Shud Hindi, it was without foreign aid, and foreign meant also Sanskrit. So it, Thank uh, you, uh, Dr. Gautam. We are uh, actually running out of time. So uh, can you yeah, please? Shud Hindi means that Bhav and Deshi words, and, and this was this because I thought Shud Hindi is Sanskrit as Hindi. No, Shud Hindi is also against Sanskrit. But anyway, um, uh, maybe Thorsten, I can answer your question. It's uh, for me, it's also very difficult in a short time to um, yeah, answer everything. So yeah, sorry for.